Shall we open our Bible this evening to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 12? Romans chapter 8, verse 12, as we continue our study through this letter that Paul began to write as a recommendation for a young lady named Phoebe, who was moving from the Corinth area to Rome, and it turned into the single, certainly greatest treatise that we have in our hands of the salvation by grace that God provides to every man through his son, Jesus. And Paul, you know, he gets into it pretty quick. He spends 17 verses in chapter 1 just saying, here's who I am. They'd never met him. Here's why I do what I do. Here's what God has called me to do. And then in chapter 1, verse 18, begins to talk about sin and man and how every man is a sinner. He starts with the perversions that everyone who lived in Corinth saw at the worship of the idols. He turned to the good man in chapter 2 who, you know, everyone might applaud, yet he's a sinner. He, he ends in chapter 2 with the religious guy who keeps all of the rules and, and, and is devout in his religion, and yet he's still a sinner. And through the middle of chapter 3, verse 20, he, he hammers home, everyone's a sinner, everyone has failed, everyone has fallen short, no matter if you're on one end of the scale or the other. And then he, then he turns, beginning in verse 21 of chapter 3, to the good news of God's love and his salvation that's available to every man, as God has always related to man, by faith in him. And beginning in chapter 3, verse um, 21, and, and, and continuing through the end of chapter 5, Paul's whole issue is faith in, in, in the work of God through his son apart from the law. It is that work of, of justifying us. God justifies man. We believe in Christ. We're saved. How do I know I'm saved? Because God said, if I believe in his son, I'm saved. If I trust in him. I don't feel saved. Nothing saying about feeling saved. That'll come. You know, the engine has to go before the caboose. The feelings usually follow the truth of faith. Then in chapter 6, Paul turns from justification to sanctification. And, and, and although justification is immediate, the moment you believe, sanctification is a lifelong process where God fills you with his spirit, teaches you his word, you know, enables you, empowers you, convinces you, wins you, brings your confidence into your life, and God begins to change you. And in chapter 6, 7, and 8, that's Paul's view, the the work of God's spirit conforming us into his image every day as he seeks to make us live lives that are equivalent to our standing with him as his kids. But it requires from us, you know, participation. We have to know that we've been delivered from the penalty of sin in Christ and that God by his spirit is now working to deliver us from the power of sin in our life, which is all that we knew until we got saved. So, you know, we have an old life and in chapter six, Paul said, here's what happened to your old life, your old man, your old ways, when you got saved. Here's how God views that person the minute you believed. And so you need to start viewing him that way as well. And you know, you're always going to be somebody's slave, but if you become Jesus a slave and really be his slave, you'll find true freedom. And so he keeps using these words, reckon or count the old man, the old life dead. Really don't give it any space. Don't give it any credit. Don't give it any room to grow. Don't feed it, you know, reckon it dead. But that's not so easy. That's easier said than done, though it has to be done. And Paul in chapter 7 spends almost the entire ch chapter giving us the intimate details of his personal struggles with his flesh. How he had learned to surrender to the Lord and, and the conflicts that he was still facing daily between the new man now that was born of the spirit that was alive to the Lord and this old man that he defined as this unredeemed flesh in which we live that one day God is going to give us a new body and then we're going to be kind of done with this. But that glorious model made, you know, without hands, eternal in the heavens, is still coming. Right now, we're still subject to this flesh. In chapter 8, the first 11 verses last time, Paul then spoke to us about this glorious promise and security that we have in Christ. There's no condemnation now. So as you struggle, as you battle, as you seek to walk with God, you know, when you hit the bumps in the road, man, you're not all that you should be, and you, you just hate failing the Lord, it breaks your heart. God's promise is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Walking in the Spirit, seeking after the Lord. The, 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 the law of the Spirit in Jesus Christ has given me victory over the power of sin. And, and verse 2 says, he enables me. In his strength, he gives me what I couldn't do on my own to walk uprightly in God's sight. I'm a new person. God's Spirit comes to live in my life. And as we looked at last week, the work of God's Spirit within is to bend you towards God. In mind, in desire, the bent of your life changes. 
You know, you're all about you and me and get and flesh and, and, and self. And, and then you got saved and God's spirit moved in and, and you began to lean towards the Lord. Things mattered about what God had to say, what he wanted for my life. Even if you, you know, for a while rebelled against him, you, you couldn't change the bend. You know, you're miserable now in the world. You can't live the way that you used to. God is bending you. And, and if the spirit of God dwells in you, Paul says, you belong to God. And his power, the same power that raised Jesus' body from the dead, will bring life to you will bring life to you. Every injunction in the Bible um, to the believer that God asks of you is always based on the premise that he will help you to accomplish his will. In other words, he doesn't dump anything on you and say, and says, good luck with that. I don't think you can do it, but good luck. I'll, I'll watch and I'll see. Instead, God promises to bless and to enable, and, and if, if there are things that we cannot do, he will enable us to do. It, it is the basis behind every epistle that Paul writes. He will spend an inordinate amount of time, oftentimes, in the epistles talking about what God has done, only to turn around and say, okay, so now here's what you can do. Because of what God has done, this is what you can do. In, in the book of Romans, it, it goes 11 chapters. It goes 11 chapters. In chapter 12, verse 1, you will read, therefore. <laughs> you know, therefore. Now, knowing all that God has done, here's what you need to do. He'll do it to the Ephesians. He'll write three chapters of all that we are, all that we have, all that God has done. And then in chapter four, verse one, therefore, you know, walk worthy of the spirit. Same letters to the Galatians, same to the Philippians, same to the Colossians. Paul always starts with, here's what God has done. Now here's what you need to do. And so that's been Paul's policy. And that's what we've been when, when working through. And tonight, we'd like to begin in verse 12 of chapter eight and then continue down through verse 27 and just look at some of the glory that is coming. Because one of the things that Paul will tell us tonight that's real important to him is, you know, not only are we obligated as, as believers to give to the Lord a sanctified life, a holy life, a, a committed, a surrendered life, but what we get at the end of this life is going to be so good, who would want to cheat on that? You know, that the future holds glory that you can't even begin to understand. That, that just will, you know, blow you out of the water. If you think about it for a while, man, whatever the Lord wants, I just want to get there, you know, with him. But verse 12, this is what Paul says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, or we're in debt, but not to the flesh, so that we could live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you live by the Spirit, you can put to death, Kathargeo, put out of business the deeds of the body, and you will live. Now, Paul has said back in verse 8 last week, you can't please the Lord in the flesh. Verse 9, but you're in the Spirit, and if the Spirit dwells in you, then Christ is in you. And then the body, verse 10 and 11, is dead to sin, but we're alive to him. So look, you're under no obligation at this point as a Christian to give your body any kind of service. You know, that thing killed you. That was the death part of life, wasn't it? That was where you found sin and rebellion and all. And that was, you know, the body is that which responds to sin. You've been delivered from that. The only person you owe now is the Lord. You owe him everything you have. You're in debt. A debtor is someone that owes. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. But, you know, I owe, I owe. That's why I'm following the Lord. He saved me. And, and in fact, Paul says here that any submission or service to your flesh is, is counterproductive. It's going to still kill you. Just like it used to, you know. You make room for the flesh. It's just death working in your life. It's, it's cutting you off from God and, and life and blessing and joy. But if the spirit, you know, dwells in you, you can put to death. You can, and the word katergeo means to cut off or to, um, or, or, or to, the literally word is to close up shop. You know, it's like bankrupt. It, it, you can bankrupt the flesh. And, and the more that you do that, the more you can live. But, but notice that, you know, we're not automatically going to do this just because we're saved and, and the Lord gives us victory. We have to be exhorted all the time. And you read through the Bible and you watch how often the Lord tells us about this new man and putting it on. It's not a natural occurrence. You know, the flesh isn't, is, is strong enough in itself to just say, no, I don't want to do that. We're going to need to put to death the flesh by not feeding it, not giving it time, not, not giving it any effort, not, not making room for it. I always use the example of going to church. I mean, you guys are here, so I guess I'm singing to the choir. But we have three services on Sunday morning. Three full services almost. And we have one on Wednesday night. So there are folks who, all right, some of them can work. Then we'll get them to church another night. But then there is that, that hunger, you know, that drives you. 
And every church I've ever been in, I've seen that the, the, the numbers of people that truly hunger after God are smaller than the numbers who come. You got to put to death, man. It has to be something that comes out of I don't want to, I don't owe the flesh anything. The flesh, it never gave me anything worthwhile. God sent his son. I'm a debtor, all right. I'm a debtor to the Lord. Up to now, all of chapter 8 has been a description of my life as a Christian, my status, my present experience, my character, my future expectations. But Paul stops to say, look, the work of God for us and in us brings with it this serious obligation to live for him and no longer for my sinful nature. It, you know, my freedom in Christ comes with an obligation. I think to the Corinthians, Paul said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. In other words, you don't own you anymore. You ran the show. You gave up. You got saved. Now, bought with a price, you should glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I believe that verse says there in um, 1 Corinthians 6.20. You are God's now. That's our obligation. And... You know, there's no condemnation. There's deliverance from sin. There, there, the, the punishment that we deserved was put upon Jesus. And now having been saved, you and I are forever in his debt. Do you feel like that tonight? Like, man, I owe the Lord everything. And the minute the flesh goes, let's do this, you go, well, I'd like to, but I owe the Lord everything. I can't really do that because I'm in debt. My life is, is, is sewn up in Christ. So you're not a debtor to your flesh. Oh, you know, i got, I got to treat myself. Well, treat yourself to life then and follow after Jesus. In, in this daily battle, we can, by the Spirit, kill the flesh. Now, in the sense that um, it's a control or it's influence or it's suggestions or it's allurements, maybe it's temptations, don't really have their way with us. The best method of, of, of most you know, victory is preventative, you know. Stay in the spirit. Stay in church. I very rarely have seen people implode and fall away that are in the Bible, in fellowship, in church, in prayer, in the Lord. I, I've seen lots of folks who stop coming, who stop reading their Bibles, who stop praying, who think, well, you know, I'll do the minimum I can to get by. And you can't get by. Preventative is the best part, you know. It's going to be hard for you to sin too much in your flesh sitting in here worshiping God. It's safe, isn't it? It's a safe place to be spiritual. All right, I'm going to worship. And you may not have wanted to be here, but you're here. And God has a way of turning the I'm here into great blessing. You know, when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talked about um, the importance of where we're headed, he said in verse 29 of chapter 5, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Better that you go into heaven blind <laughs> then fully with your faculties you end up in hell. The point isn't to yank out body parts. The point is there is tremendous, uh, you know, there is tremendous value placed on where we're headed and whatever would keep you from that isn't worth it, you know? You might as well live without it. Well, I want to have me one of those. I got to have me two of these. I got to get involved. And what about, and I can't fit it all in. Well, just make sure that you fit the Lord in. No measure taken is too drastic in fighting against sin. And Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We, we walk in the flesh. We live in this body. We don't war according to the flesh. Our, our, our warfare weapons aren't carnal, but they're mighty through God to their pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ. Man, that's the battle. And Paul starts in verse 12 by saying, look, we're in debt, but not to the flesh, because that'll just kill you. But if you're, if you're in debt to the Lord, you can, you can put out of business the deeds of your body. You can find real life. You know, most people can make moderate changes to their external behavior to win approval. You know, somebody that's really, you know, loud and obnoxious and everyone says so can, you know, maybe reel themselves in. You can, you can work real hard in your life to be admired and, and to be, um, you know, esteemed, if you will, or to be, to be uh, acceptable. Yet, as believers in Christ, which makes you far different than the world in all of its efforts, you can starve out the flesh by serving the Lord. And Paul says, not only is that possible, but you're, it's an obligation. It becomes a debt to you. 
and I. We, we need to let God's spirit run free in our lives so that we might find God's best. That's the battle. And, and invariably, you go back to people in counseling and you say this to them, are you going to church? No. Do you have Christian friends or secular friends? Well, I just hang around guys at work. You know, are you reading your Bible? What's your favorite verse? What's the greatest book that you've read? What's the most that you've ever read? It's a big book, man. Come on, give me a break. Yeah. Never was a good reader. Got stuff on tape now. Just listen, you know. And then you die, spiritually. But if you stay plugged in, you know, if you stay plugged in. And this is no new idea. Paul had mentioned it back in chapter 6, that our union with Christ would allow us to reckon the old man dead. Here, just, he just says, look, it's an obligation. You know, when King Saul was um, ordered by God to destroy all of the Amalekites there in the Old Testament, the Amalekites were a type of sin. And you see them represented that way throughout the Bible. He spared some of the best sheep. He spared their king when... The prophet came, Samuel, to him um, and asked him what was the noise he was hearing because Samuel was old and blind. Saul sought to um, defend his actions by saying the people's choice was to later sacrifice them to the Lord. But for now, you know, they would save them. And, and Samuel, the old codger, you know, in touch with God, always speaking the Lord's word, he, he said to Saul, do you really think that God has a greater joy or finds greater delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and he doesn't just obeying his voice. You know, then, then he went on and he said, to obey is far better than sacrifice and to heed the Lord far better than the fat of the rams, the, the best part on the, on the offering, you know, the best sacrifice you can make. Even that doesn't compare to just obedience. That's what God is looking for. And Saul lost the kingdom. Paul puts it in the same terms. We owe the spirit our service and our lives. What has the flesh ever done for us. It, it, I think there's great health to be had spiritually when you see at least part of your relationship with God when in terms of obedience, in terms of obligation. You know, that, that it isn't just, hey, I can if I want to. No, 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 you must. You want God to deliver on his part. You die tonight, you go, man, I hope he's right. I hope he's telling me the truth. I hope I'm in Christ. And the Lord, you show up and the Lord goes, I'm just kidding, man. That's just ridiculous. Really? To hell with you. No, you're hoping he holds up his end of the bargain. Well, he wants you, too, to hold up your end. You, you've, you've given him your life. He's bought you. He's paid for you. You belong to him. Surrendering to him. And, and you know, the 12 spies go out there into Canaan, and two come back, and, and they believe God, Joshua and Caleb, and they, they tell everyone, come on, man, there's giants in the land, but we can take them. You know, the Lord is with us. And they, they, they try to encourage the people it was a good land, and if the Lord delights in us, you know, don't fear. And, and all of the rest of the, the, the spies came back, and all they saw was difficulty, and they refused to obey. They turned the hearts of the people against their God. And, and all of the congregation wanted to wipe them out. Two guys who said, we can trust the Lord. But that's what pleases the Lord. Surrendering to the flesh just leans you in the direction of death. Surrendering to the spirit leans you in the direction of life. When, when Peter wrote to the scattered saints, his second, uh, no, yeah, it's his second epistle. And, and early on in chapter one, he said, look, for this reason, you should give every diligence to add to your faith virtue and add to your virtue knowledge and add to your knowledge self-control and add to self-control perseverance and add to perseverance godliness and add to that brotherly kindness and add to that love because if these things are in you and if these things abound you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but if you lack these things it's because you're short-sighted even to blindness and you've forgotten how you were cleansed from your old sin so look brethren make diligently sure of your calling be sure of the place you stand because if you do these things you'll never stumble an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior do them life and Paul says therefore in verse 12 that can be your testimony if you see it as an obligation and you understand that it's God's work in you this can be your testimony uh, and, and even if we do all of those things you know that's the best we can do we're in debt that, that, that Luke Chapter 17, I guess, a passage where um, the Lord tells the parable and then he says, likewise you, when you have done all of these things that are commanded, you say of yourself, 
we're just unprofitable servants and have just done what it is our duty to do. That's the same issue. It's the, the obligation of the saint to, to his Savior. You know, I'm obeying. Well, of course you are. You're going to heaven. Your sins are wiped away. Your name is written in the book. You're, you've got eternal life. Big deal you should serve that God. Of course you should. Of course you should. Living in the spirit, life of devotion, I, I square my thinking with his word. And it can be done. In fact, he says in verse 14, as many of you as are led by the spirit of God, you're the sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You rather received the spirit of adoption by whom you can cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. I love these verses of great assurance, you know. If you're led of the Spirit, there's proof that you're God's child. The, the, the fact that, that you don't fear now, but you look forward to standing before God and meeting him and, and being welcomed by him is, is the evidence of God's Spirit working in your life. You're, you're, you're now a child that's been adopted. You can call the Lord Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit will give you both in verse 16, not only that outward assurance, but that inward witness to your spirit that you belong to God. Verse 14, leading, being led of the spirit is, is really the test of the spiritual life. You know, people say, well, how come you? my mom, I remember when I got saved, she, I said, I'm going to church. It was a, a Sunday night. And she goes, it's Sunday night. I go, I know they got Bible study. And she goes, well, it's crazy. Didn't you go this morning? I go, yeah, well, you don't have to go back. I said, I don't. She goes, no, no, once is plenty. A lot of people don't go at all. Once is good. I said, yeah, but I want to go. And she says, oh, honey, you don't. What are you doing? Are you doing drugs there? Is there drugs there? <laughs> I said, no, 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 I just want to go to church, you know. And, and God began to make me willing to do, prompting my heart, you know. I don't always do what I should. I don't always do it the way I should. But I sense that the Lord is changing my life. And it begins, I think, in the will of the heart, in the desire of the heart, you know. Um, I'm the Lord who teaches you to profit, the Lord said through Isaiah to the people, who leads you in the way that you should go. If you would heed my commandments, you could have peace like a river, and you could have righteousness like the waves of the sea. I'm the Lord who will do that. He says here the same thing. If you're being led of the Spirit, you're God's children, it shows in your life. Jesus said there in, in John um, chapter 14, these things that I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things. So bring all things to remembrance, whatever I've taught you. That's the work of God's Spirit. And, and you know, even in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon people for service, without a guarantee that it would be permanent, his presence was recognized and acknowledged oftentimes by everyone. Not just the saints, but the world. You know, the fellow, the Pharaoh there who, who took Joseph in. And, and when Joseph came and brought the interpretations of his dream that he couldn't find anyone in his kingdom to do. And they brought him out of jail, Joseph. You know, and Joseph, through this process, became second in command. Um, the Pharaoh said to one of his servants after Joseph was finished, can we find such a one as this in whom is the Spirit of God? I mean, he didn't know that Spirit of God, but he saw that God was there. You know, that's the indication in verse 14 that we can know. It, it amazes me that often it, it is the people not walking with God, not following his spirit, not obedient to his word, not hungry to know him, that seem to have the greatest worry about where they stand with God. And, and I guess, well, you should. You know, how do you know if you're out there and you're living on both sides of the fence? He says in verse 15 that the old spirit of sin and death was a, a slavery and a fear. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but, you know, people in the world are pretty good at masking the, the reality of their fear. But sinful people live in fear. You know, sometimes it's short-term fear. You know, what if I'm going to be sick? What, i got a pain. i got to hurt. What happens to me now? Others, it's a more long-term fear. I'm going to die one day, you know. Get it while you can get it, because this isn't all, you know, this is all there is. And they fear the future. They fear death. They fear judgment. Um, there are very few people I've ever prayed with in the hospital that died angry with God. They all want to make it right then. I did have a guy one time at, uh, at Rancho in, in, in Downey uh, go to pray with him. He's dying of liver cancer. His son asked me to go, and I walked in, and his father started cursing at me. He told me to get out. And I said, look, you know, your son tells me you have a week left to live. Maybe we ought to talk about where you're headed. And he said, if you don't get the so-and-so out of here, and he started cursing at me again. I said, dude, I'm leaving. Um, but I'm going to pray for you in the hallway. And I took three steps out of his room, and he died. 
I don't know too many folks that die with that kind of, you know, to the end, you know, I'm going to just take a stand. But, but the world is in slavery to fear. And then the Holy Spirit comes into my life and he brings peace. Paul said to Timothy from jail before he died, the spirit that God has given us is not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Paul says the same thing here. Look, God not only changes you by the spirit of God who lives in you, but he changes your outlook so that now you have peace. We have a spirit of adoption. You've been placed into God's family. God took you from the world and from the lies of the devil and from making your own way. You know, regeneration, which is another word for being born again, brought new life, but adoption brings a new status. Now you're God's kids. You weren't always God's kids. You were, you were enemies of God, all of us, until we got saved. If you follow adoption through the Bible, the first adoption in the Bible was that of Moses by Pharaoh's daughter, and she was moved out of emotion and sympathy. We can't let this little baby drown. She didn't necessarily have much of affection for it because she said to, to Moses' then sister, here, just take him to a Hebrew woman and have her nurse him. You know, she didn't seem to have any bond, but she just had empathy and sympathy uh, for a little baby that was on its own. The next adoption in the Bible was that of Esther um, by her older cousin Mordecai upon the death of her family. And, and according to Esther 2, it was a family duty that was required. You needed to take care of your own. It, wasn't, uh, it was not just empathy or sympathy. It was oblig obligatory, you know. Uh, maybe the most touching adoption in the Bible is the adoption of Mephibosheth, who was the crippled son of Jonathan, Saul's son, to whom David gave all of the land of Saul and honored his friendship by, of Jonathan by taking this crippled boy in, 2 Samuel 9, letting him sit at the table, caring for him, giving him stuff that he had no right to anymore. <laughs> you know, Saul had lost his kingdom and his family. David wasn't moved by sympathy, and David wasn't moved at all by obligation. David was moved by love. He took him into his family by love. The, the name Mephibosheth means a shameful thing. He, he grew up in a town called Lodabar, which is a word that means no pasture, no place to eat. <laughs> You know, but by the grace of God, David gave him an inheritance he was no longer legally entitled to, not by sympathy, not by obligation, but by love. And, and it is that kind of assurance when you're taken in like that, that, that you are loved, you are adopted, you know. So here's the assurance that, that gives us, that we can come to God and we can cry out Abba, which is an Aramaic word. For Papa, in fact, if you're in Israel ever and you hear the Hebrew kids crying for their dad, that's, this is the word they'll use, you know, loudly. Daddy, Papa. Wow. <laughs> and no Old Testament Jew ever addressed God directly as Father. Jesus changed all that for us, right? He came upon the scene and, and he used that very same word in the garden. If you go to, to Mark chapter 14 and, and you hear Jesus crying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. He uses the term for daddy, the intimate relationship with, between he and the Father. But you don't see him using it on the cross when he became sin for us and he is cut out from, from that relationship. Now he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's not that intimacy any longer. He, he, he pays the price so that you and I can be grafted in and, and, and brought in. And saved. And he suffers in my place. He's alienated. But, but everywhere else in the Gospels, you'll find Jesus boldly declaring his relationship with the Father, using that word. In fact, it so angers his enemies that, you know, oftentimes they see it as just highly irreverent. Oftentimes they just say, that's the kind of blasphemy that requires death. It stirred them up. It, it moved them to hate him. But look, as a Christian, I, I, there's no unhealthy fear of the future. You know, God has brought us into his family we have full access. We are adopted out of love. We can live without fear. And we weren't always in God's family. I don't know if you've ever heard people go in the world, yeah, everybody's God's child. Really? You know, in the sense that everyone was created by God, but that isn't relationship. That, that's, you know, master and savior. In fact, Jesus said in John 8 to some guys who had initially said they believed in him, look, a, 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 um, if you commit sin, you're a slave of sin, and a slave doesn't live in the house forever. But a son does. So if the son makes you free, then you're free. And he was speaking to religious folks who thought they were fine in their religion to say, look, unless you have the son, 
You know, you're a slave, but you're a slave to sin. And Jesus even said to these guys, I know, I know you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I'm telling you what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. And if God were your father, you'd love me. But his implication was, God's not your father. You don't love him. So, so not everybody belongs to the family of God. Yet, you know, for us to be taken into God's family, that's pretty radical, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're, we're dead and we get his spirit. Now we have life. It's supernatural. You know, Nicodemus went, wait a minute, back into the womb? I don't know. He was all confused, right, about the new birth. But it's a radical kind of supernatural work. And it's far-reaching. I mean, it's eternal. I, I'm God's child now. How can I know that I'm being led of the Spirit? Well, here's a simple answer. You know, your mind will be renewed. Your heart will be stirred. Your will will be directed. You'll refuse the ways of the flesh. You'll just know that you know that you know. God is just working in you. You know, you're weird now to the world. In fact, notice in verse 16 that the Holy Spirit bears witness not to your feelings, which can fluctuate, or even just to your mind. But to your very own spirit, this, there is this internal assurance where you simply just know that you know. It's not that I feel saved because I don't always feel saved. People do that all the time. I don't feel saved, so I do this. How does saved feel? And they go, well, I don't know. I said, well, maybe you're feeling it then. <laughs> you know, if I'm really sick and laying in bed and puking my guts out, I don't feel good about anything. I don't feel much like, I feel like I'm going to die. But I don't. You don't have to feel like you're saved. You have to know that you're saved. Feelings will follow the facts. And God will assure you internally in your heart. Genuine experience will confirm it. John, you know, was 90 years old when he wrote 1 John. And he said there in chapter uh, 3, verse 18, My little children, love not in word or in tongue, but love in deed and in truth. And by this you will know that you are in the truth, and you can assure your heart before him. If your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart, and he knows all things. If your heart condemn you not, then you can begin to have confidence towards God. You know, the minute that you know where you stand with God, man, there's a lot of joy, isn't there? Don't worry about that. Paul uh, said to the Hebrews there in at the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, look, lay aside all of these rudiments of the faith and move on, man. Grow up. Worrying about, am I saved? Am I right? Am I not right with God? Oh, woe is me. Get on with life. Get over the hump. <laughs> Get past it. And we need to. Because God has saved us. And his spirit has come to tell us and to convict us. Then he says this in verse 17, and if we're children, if we know that, then we're going to be heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So if we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. The assurance of our future is linked to our adoption. If you're children, then you're going to be an heir, you know, and, and you're going to be God's heirs, and you're going to share that inheritance, if you will, with Jesus, to whom the Father has given all things, Hebrews, or is that chapter one, Yeah. So his point is, any cost involved, any struggle now to follow him, any battle that we have to fight to walk in the Spirit will seem like nothing compared to the glory that's waiting for us in heaven. And I think that's quite a statement in and of itself, but it's, it's more impactful coming from Paul, who had sure gone through it, hadn't he? I mean, you read in 2 Corinthians, and he says, you know, if you think you're a minister of Christ and I'm speaking as a fool, I'm more of a minister of Christ. And then he starts to brag, I've been in labor more often, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in death often, five times the Jews tried to give me 40 stripes minus one, three times I've been beaten by rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, I spent a night and a, a day in the ocean. He went on and on, you go, you're right, you are more, <laughs> you have suffered more than I have. And then he goes on and he talks about the perils of, of water and journey and robbers and countrymen and Gentiles and city and wilderness and sea and false brethren and weariness and toil and sleepiness. And he goes, oh yeah, and then I got to take care of the church. We go, all right, yeah, you went through it more than we did. And you get here and Paul writes, well, I just figured that, you know, what we're going through now is nothing. And by the way, the word consider here in verse 18 is the same word as reckon. Reckon the old man dead. It literally means come to a numerical calculation, weigh the evidence, and come to the right conclusion. Look, whatever it is that you've got to go through to walk with Jesus now, do it. 
because what awaits you is not a fair exchange. You get far more than you're giving, no matter if you give everything. You're getting far more. And, and Paul is able to, to say it to the Romans, look, you know, the saints, I, I know that whatever we're facing is, is nothing because we're God's kids. We're going to make it. And notice the contrast from verse 17 to verse 18, from, the, from suffering to glory, you know, uh, from the hurts to the hallelujahs. Go read Hebrews 11. Look at guys like, you know, Abraham or Abel or Enoch or, or Noah or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph. Look, look at those folks that are nameless at the end of chapter 11 where we read women received their dead back to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They might get a better resurrection. Man, the church has gone through it over the years, hasn't it? And, and all, we, all the Lord wants us to do is walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Oh, it's so hard. Just wait till you see what you're going to get. Just wait till you see what you're going to get. When, when Jesus was on the, the road to Emmaus and he, you know, confronted this couple who were just sure that they missed the boat with Jesus. And it was Sunday afternoon, you know, and he was um, catching up with them. And he begins to lay out for them the scriptures. But he begins with the words, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into glory? Isn't this the way that Jesus brought us life? When, when Paul was dying in the Mamertine prison there in, in, in Rome, he, he wrote to Timothy, he said, look, I fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, and there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me not on that day, and not just me only, but everyone who loves his appearing. You're going to get to the end of your life one day and, and be so glad that you felt obligated to serve God. You know, that you counted it as a necessary deal, that, that, that the early church did it, they suffered greatly. You know, Peter went to jail, John went to jail, Paul was in prison, Stephen was killed, James was beheaded. You know, make a list. People go, oh, I wish I was around in the first century. I don't. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm around now in America where people leave me alone for being a Christian, you know? Seriously? But the suffering proves the adoption. Blessed are you when men speak evil of you, persecute you. For my name's sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. And, you know, Jesus said there in John 15, if the world hates you, it hated me. If you're of the world, it'd love you, but you're not. You're with me. That's why you're catching it. Suffering will find us, but suffering will assure us and train us and purify us. And Paul looks at the assuring aspect. Notice verse 18. Look, I reckon <laughs> the suffering of this present time is not worthy. And then he says, and what follows down through verse 27 is Paul, I, I guess he got on glory there in verse 18 and went, you know, that's not a bad subject. And he kind of parks on the verse to talk about, you know, one day in glory the battle is going to be over and we're going to get out of this body. But in the meantime, we groan and sigh and grieve and lament and we long to be delivered. But there are great verses about looking ahead with eagerness to the future. So Paul says this in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Paul tells us that all of creation, and by the way, the word creation there is not a reference to man. It is a, rather a personification of everything that isn't a person. It is all that God has made. And it literally says, the creation of God eagerly waits for the revealing of you and I as children of God to be fully redeemed. In other words, it also finds redemption from its creator long since suffered through man's fall. Their expectation is that when you get right and, and, and redeemed fully, then they're going to be restored. In fact, the words earnest expectation is a, one of these vivid kind of Greek words that means to stand up on your toes and to strain your neck. It's kind of like someone who, who is greatly expecting, you know, you to come into your glory. You know, when the Lord comes back, the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. Right now, that won't happen. You know, there won't be any weeds or poisonous plants or thorns or thistles. Everything that the man sin affected decay and disease and neglect and misuse and natural disasters and pollution and earthquakes and hurricanes and every form of evil, you know, that sin has just started the whole process. When the Lord comes, all of creation is going to go, ah, now we can go back to what we were intended to do. Yet even despite the curse of sin, much in nature still resounds with the beauty of the Lord. Paul, you know, talked about the reality of that in Romans chapter 1. 
He says in verse 20, for, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. The word futility means just that, a lack of success. The idea being that nature was cursed by God through man's sin. And any noble effort made by man to protect her, to restore her, is helpless in the face of sin's consequence, this, this wave of decay, you know. Paul, um, no, that's not right. Peter said in his second letter, since everything that we see is going to be dissolved, what kind of people should we be in holiness and godly conduct as we look for and we hasten towards the coming of the day of the Lord when the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will burn with fervent heat, and we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, this old planet, I know that there's a huge move towards ecology and green planet, and, you know, I appreciate that, but look, it's not going to work. Sin is going to destroy. Creation cries out, come, Lord, fix stuff, because <laughs> man and his sin will not. There'll be the, the green people over here and the dumping it into the swamp over here, you know? Sin just works that way. It's just life, you know? It's the way it is, and, and, and the Bible says... You know, creation is subject to, to not succeeding on its own until the Lord comes and restores what sin has destroyed, you know. Yet he who cursed it, the Lord, also subjected it to hope so that all of creation longs for the coming of the Lord. You know, Revelation 21, verse 5, Then he that sat on the throne, John writes, said, Behold, I make all things new. Write it down, John. These words are true and faithful. When the Lord comes, hey, you want to see, you know, uh, things work out on the planet? Just watch when Jesus comes. And by the way, then he's going to get rid of it and start off. But he'll just show you how he can fix it first. Nice to have a biblical outlook. Verse 21 says, because the creation itself was also, will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Or in other words, creation will one day find themselves redeemed in a way to be restored to God's original intention. You, you can see it in the millennial kingdom as Jesus rules and reigns on the earth. You know, today, what rules the world from a physics standpoint is entropy. Now, entropy is a, a, a law of physics that contradicts evolution because it literally says it is the degrading of every matter and energy into uh, the most uh, randomness possible or the most uh, disorder possible. Things wear out. You don't get a new car that gets newer. You get a new car that starts to rust, fall apart, goes flat, gets ugly, you know, loses a paint job, tears the leather, whatever. Your car's not getting better. It's getting worse. You look in the mirror. You're not getting better. I know you'd like to argue with me, but look, I've seen you, some of you for many years. You're not getting any better looking over here. And you don't have any lights on you, you know. We're dying. We're rotten. We're going. There we go. Wee. But when the Lord comes, all will be made new and then a new heaven and a new earth. So all of creation anticipates the coming completion of Jesus' redeeming work. And Paul says, we know. That all of creation, the whole of creation, is groaning and laboring with birth pangs together until now. Like a woman going through labor pains giving birth. It's a hard process. It's a difficult process. Yet when people talk about their kids, they rarely ever show the wife like in the midst of like contractions. Screaming, you know, hurting, you know, the veins sticking out right here. My wife, get out of here, she yelled at me one time. What, honey, I'm, I'm right here. I'm fine. You know, I don't know what your problem is. They always show you the mom with the kid after everything's fine. <laughs> Looks like me, you know, and mom's got her hair combed. and We always get to see the picture of the fruit, not the labor, you know? And Paul goes, hey, we're groaning, man. The world is groaning. You read of earthquakes, the world's groaning. You look for, you know, the weather things and the problems and the disasters, and the Lord's coming. We live for him, and if you don't, you may get caught up in one of those disasters, then it's too late for you. You should live for him, you know. But the Lord's coming. And when he comes, all of creation is going to go, ah. Now the whole world is just, ah. Oh. You look in the mirror, here's what you do. Oh, come, Jesus, please. Oh. And then your wife looks and goes, oh, Lord, come quickly, please. <laughs> the Lord comes. He's going to make it well. 
So Paul says in verse 23, not only that, but we also who have now the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption and the redemption of our bodies. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So Paul says, just like the world is groaning, we Christians who have been adopted into the family of God are groaning. And the word means to sigh or to weep or to pine. That's kind of an old word, I guess. To long for this final aspect of our adoption. We're spiritually God's kids, but we need to have these bodies redeemed. Paul wrote to the Corinthians at the end of the uh, chapter 15. He said, look, we're not going to... Uh, you know, all sleep, but we're going to all be changed. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise incorruptible, and will be changed. And corruption has to put on incorruption, and, and mortality has to put on immortality. And so we need to get rid of this old body, you know. We need, a, we need that body made with, with God's hands, eternal in the heaven. We need the heavenly body, don't we? And then, oh, man, no more wars, no more, no more you know, difficulties, no more fighting. It's the mansion Jesus speaks of in John 14. You know, he's going to go prepare a place for us. I guarantee it's not going to be four bedroom, three bath on half an acre. It's going to be your new glorified body where you might dwell with him forevermore. But notice Paul says we have the first fruits of life. We're tasting and seeing the work of God. We're seeing the victory. We're experiencing God giving us victory over the flesh. So that produces even more groaning and longing. Because now when we feel, oh, come on. And we do it in hope, in a confident manner. And we wait patiently by faith, and we wait eagerly. Paul said to the Philippians, we, we are confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you is going to finish it. Oh. And then he adds finally in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. So the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered, and it is he who searches the heart, knows the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, if you go from where we just began in verse 19, creation groans, God's people groan, and add to the list one more groany, the Holy Spirit groans. Except... He doesn't just give us counsel, he actively intercedes for us with the Father. As we engage in the struggle and with our flesh and with difficulty and we want to know the will of God and, and there's times that we don't, God's promise is the spirit who dwells within us will, will intercede for us. That's pretty good to know. You know, People sometimes go, I don't know what to pray for. I just say, well, just pray. God will figure it out. If you're praying weird, he'll fix it. He just likes you to come and ask, you know. Uh, you know, at times you, you're just not able to articulate your heart, know the will of God, the Holy Spirit of God, knows the will of God, knows our hearts, knows our needs, helps us to pray, speaks on our behalf. That's pretty good to know while we're waiting, isn't it? Next week we will start in verse 28, and we will go to the end of the chapter, and we'll be standing for the whole thing cheering. So bring tennis shoes next Wednesday night. Father, we thank you tonight as we sit together for the awesome work of your spirit that assures us tonight of where we stand. And Lord, for your promise that we're going to go from this difficulty to glory. We pray tonight that, Lord, as we begin our study tonight, looking really at the obligation that we have to live for you, that we might see, really, your calling upon us to, to live holy lives as an obligation. That It really isn't a suggestion. It isn't just a, a, a wishful thinking on God's part. We, we're obligated now. We've been bought with a price. We have an obligation to serve you. And Lord, as we do, as we open our heart and as we look to you and as we begin to walk with you, you said that we would be able to overcome the flesh. Led of the Spirit, we'd be assured. No more fear, but, but, but adoption. And because of the adoption, access to our Father in heaven and a future inheritance with Jesus. So for now, we go through it and we suffer and our flesh doesn't always get what it wants, but there's glory coming. And as the world and creation groans, and, and it's, as its hope is, is the hope that we have, that the Lord will come and restore. So we groan, having tasted of the first fruits of your work. 
we want you to be in charge of everything, Lord, that nothing is out of your, out of your will, that everything lines up with your desire. And even the Holy Spirit living within us will groan in our behalf. Groanings that can't be uttered, he will lay before the Father for us, those things that we can't seem to bring to, to clarity and lay clearly before God and articulate well. He will intercede for us because he knows the mind and the heart and, and the will of God. So, Father, may we tonight just surrender ourselves to you. Be those, those submitted believers, obligated, following after, realizing that, boy, it may be hard now, but glory is coming. It may be difficult today. It may be hard to put the things of the Spirit first, but, Lord, what awaits us such glory? And if tonight, you know, you've been struggling, maybe that's what you need to think about, the obligation that you owe to the Lord and what he's promised to do by his spirit in your life. If you'll just put yourself in that place of, you know, following after him, obediently responding to him. Like the two spies instead of the ten. You'll listen, you'll, you'll follow. Not like Saul and the people halfway obeying, calling that faith to obey better, better than sacrifice. Serve the Lord by faithfully following him first. That's what we need to do. As we wait, that's what we're going to do. It's until the Lord comes and, and the groaning can stop and the joy can begin. If tonight you need prayer, the pastors will be up front. If you don't have Jesus living in your heart, if you aren't saved, if you couldn't say tonight, I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me and my hope is in him. And would you grab one of these men at the front here after the service and say, would you pray with me? I want to get saved tonight. I want to be sure that if I were to die on the way home, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to go be with the Lord. Would you come and pray? Don't leave until God resolves that between you and him. You must, the Bible says, be born again to see and enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be saved. Are you saved? If you're not, come. Be saved. God is waiting to fill your heart. He's been sending his spirit after you to bring you to church, to get you to pay attention. If you're not saved, come tonight, get saved, and rejoice the heart of God. Shall we stand?